Hello, New Hope family. We're so glad that you're with us this evening. Uh, I pray that this sermon isn't just a sermon, but it would be a word in season that would speak to your heart. We're going to be going through the book of Romans, and the title of my message, here it is, is Love Beyond What Is Expected. To love beyond what is expected. My question, my first question is, have you ever been, you know, someone has ever tried to run you off the road? Uh, because that happened to me. I, I was actually driving on the road and I was uh, passing Waikele, which is on the west side of Oahu. And I noticed this man to my left and he's looking at me and I'm looking at him. He doesn't look very malicious, so, but he kind of has this weird smirk, this little stare like, I'm like, oh, okay. So I wave at him. I'm like, hi. And he looks at me again, again and again. He goes, huh. And finally, I'm like, oh, man, this guy's really staring into my car. And then he starts to kind of like speed up and then slow down. I'm like, what's going on? And then finally, this man swerves out and tries to ram me off the road right next to Waikele. I moved to the side, actually, and pushed out of my lane. And then I go back in my lane and I see this man. I'm like, what's going on? And then finally he does it in. He comes in, he tries to ram me off the road again. And finally the third time he tries to ram me off the road and I look at him and I open my window. This might have not been the smartest thing to do, but I put my body outside the window and I say, it's me. Like, who, why are you trying to ram me off the road? And it's so funny, right in that moment, he looked over, saw me, shocked, and drove off. <laughs> Needless to say, in that moment, I, I developed a fear. And he became, quote unquote, my boogeyman. And, and I used to look to my left, look to my right for this person trying to ram me off the road. Have you ever experienced that? A person who might be trying to ram you off the road, or you felt that division, or you felt that, that tension between people. Paul the Apostle, who is the author of this book, was just like that. He was the boogeyman to the Christians. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He was uh, circumcised on the eighth day, which was in accordance to the Hebrew law. He was studied under Gamaliel, who was renowned as a great mentor, and he was the boogeyman to all the Christians. They would just hear his name and they would tremble in fear. He would take letters uh, of acceptance so that he could go and, and arrest them. And he would sit by and see people get martyred and he would sit in approval. But one day, this man who was so against Christ and Christianity met Jesus face to face on the road to Damascus. That one moment transformed everything. And from that moment, he began to use that, his Roman name, Paul, because he was a sent one, an apostle, a sent one, a representative of God's love to the Gentile world. Not only was he reaching Christians, but he was reaching Christians that were Gentiles. Wow, how the tables have turned. And I believe that you and I know that when God touches our life, we are never the same. So he's writing, Paul the Apostle, this transformed man of God is writing to the Romans. And the, what's happening right now in the Romans is massive division. The multi-ethnic, the multi-cultured, they, they they're, have division on food rights, on circumcision, on the Sabbath. They are divided of what it looks like to live as Christians, non-Christian, uh, Jews that are Christians, and then Christians uh, that are Gentiles. So there's this collision. Have you ever felt that pull towards division? Have you ever felt that nudge towards unforgiveness, anger, and even hate? 
I felt that. But God says there's a better way. In fact, it's in unity that God bestows a blessing. And the one way that the enemy wants to bring a curse is through division. In Psalm 133, 1 and verse 3, it says this, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. That's so amazing that God says, in unity, that's where he bestows a blessing. When God's people come together in unity. So what is the one way that God uh, wants to bless us? Through unity. What is the one way that enemy wants to destroy us? Through division. But Christ has a way. And, and, and you might be asking, hey, what is it? What is it? Get our act together? What do we need to do for this unity to happen? Well, I want to say just really quickly, we can't do it alone. We can't. It's too hard to love with that kind of love so exceptionally. To love like Christ is so divine. We need his help. So I love what Paul does. Paul actually does this. In the beginning of Romans, he's trying to unify the church. And he's actually, kind of practically, he's trying to unify this church in Rome so that he can use this church as a launching point to Spain because he wants to reach the world. Now, what happens is that he's trying to unify this church. What does he do? Does he say, get your act together? No. The first thing he does, he says, look at the righteousness of God. Look at his faithfulness. Look at his goodness. Look at his love. Look how he has been faithful to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look how he's fulfilled his promise to his people. So it's almost like he's saying, take your eyes of what you can do, take your eyes off of what he has done or she has done and put your eyes on the author and the perfecter of your faith. For the joy sent before him, he endured the cross and sat down at the right hand of God. It's almost like God's saying, look at me, look at my love. So I believe that one of the main pushing points of the book of Romans is this. It's God's redemptive plan to bring us a new status, a new family, a new future, and finally, a new hope. And through this plan and through us, his representatives, we would share God's love to the world. That is good news. Can I tell you though, the good news isn't that good until we see the, the bad news. The bad news is, is so clear in scripture that that we have fallen from grace. And we see that some of the best news is, is shown when there's this backdrop of darkness. And we can see this is evident in Romans. In Romans 6.23, it says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's look at that first part of that, and it says the wages of sin is death. Now, there's actually two types of death. We see in the Garden of Eden in, in Genesis, it says that surely the day that you eat of this, you will surely die. However, they didn't die right away. What was that death? That death was that separation between them and the author of life, God. So this is a separation of this relationship that we are supposed to have with God who brings life. And then the second part of that death is a physical death that comes from that. But I think we can see just in the evidence of life that sin, which is pride, lust, jealousy, anger, and rage can destroy lives and families. There's consequences and ramifications to our sin, and we can see it. But here's the good news. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Wow. Eternal life. So the point one is this. Faith in Jesus gives us a new status. 
faith in Jesus gives us a new status. Romans 5, 8 says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Before we got our act together, before we said sorry, before we stopped hurting him, he still died for us. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever forgiven somebody that was still hurting you, still throwing abuse at you? Jesus Christ exemplifies this right here, that he showed even though, even though we did not repent, he already died for us us. And it says that now because of this, because you put your faith in Jesus, that your status has changed. And we all know this. Know this. If you on Facebook, what, what happens? You can look at your status. You can look at somebody's, are they single or are they married? I remember this one time I, I, I did a, a wedding. It was my first and last one so far. So if you want me to officiate your wedding, I got you. Anyways, uh, I remember it was a beautiful day. It was at Holly Eva, beautiful the wind was coming in and there were people around playing, playing Hawaiian music. It was just a beautiful day with the family of the bride and groom. And I remember there's this moment, this is climactic moment where everyone is excited for. And the statement is, I now pronounce you man and wife. You may kiss the bride. There's a status, two whole people became one and now their status is be, it was single, now they're married. And it's almost like the Lord saying, our status is, I now pronounce you reborn. You see, God became what we were so that we could become who he is. That because of his death, we now have life. And because he uh, took on our unrighteousness, we are now the righteousness of God. And we were enemies of God, but because Christ took our wrath that we deserved, we are now sons and daughters of the risen King. That's how our status has changed. Christ has made us a part of his family. Part, point two, and it's this faith in Jesus gives us a new family. Faith in Jesus gives us a new family. Romans 8, 14 to 15 says this, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship or daughtership. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. By Him we cry, Abba, Father. And how many of us know in that first portion of that scripture, it says that we've become sons and daughters. We, we are family now. How many of you guys have met great friends or mentors or uh, even best friends? Some of you guys have even met your wife and your husband here. <laughs> it was in the church. The body of Christ is now called the family of Christ. And can I tell you right now that the family of Christ has issues just like we all do. But in the family of Christ, that's where we get to show the love of God. Not our own love, because our, our love is limited, but the love of God that's sacrificial and eternal. And I love this. In Hawaiian, we call this word, it's hanai, which means like this adopted child. And you're not less than you're exactly, in fact, you're in the same level as blood. You are hanai. You're an adopted child of God. You are in the family of Christ. And I pray that you know that, that you're part of this body across the world. It reminds me of uh, our friend, her, her name is Kanani. And uh, she uh, was hanging out with us, with uh, Christina. And she just came around a lot. And she was like opiki, which is like a, a sea snail. And she just stuck around. We started feeding her. And we know when she started feeding something, it's never going to leave. <laughs> But she just stuck around. It was awesome. And what was so funny, she slowly became my sister. She came, became a daughter to my dad. In fact, my dad walked her down the aisle. And we still hang out. And she has, I believe, five kids now. And we still enjoy our, uh, company with her. Why? Because it was through the body of Christ. 
that's what it looks like to be a, a part of this family. Now, third is this. That faith in Jesus gives us a new future. Faith in Jesus gives us a new future. Romans 15, 11 to 12 says this. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him the Gentiles will have hope. Now this is actually a prophecy. This is a prophecy in Isaiah, Isaiah 11. And this is about 700 years before Christ comes. And it says that this prophecy, the Gentiles will have hope. Because the root of Jesse will arise. That's so beautiful because the root of Jesse has come. The root of Jesse, the hope of the Gentiles, has come. And now we have this hope in him that when we trust in him, that we, when we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, that we are saved. And would you just take a moment with me and just, just a few moments just to remind yourself of that moment when you decided to follow Jesus and you felt those chains fall off. And you felt that new hope that Jesus Christ was before you and that Jesus Christ had good things for you. Can I just say right now that because of the root of Jesse, Jesus Christ, that hope is alive today. You and I are now brothers and sisters in Christ and our eternal life now is together. So what does this mean? What does it look like that we have a new status in Christ? And now that we have a new family in Christ, and now that we have a new future in Christ, can I just conclude in just a story and action step? So if we kind of kick back the story to Paul, and this is before Paul became, you know, Paul became the Christian that we know that is reaching the Gentile world. Before that, he would actually stand by and approve of the murder of the first martyr, and his name is Stephen. And Stephen reflects the love and exceptional love that Christ has shown on the cross. And I just want to read what Stephen said right before he passed away. And it says this, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And it's almost like this de depiction that he was standing. And he says, Father, receive my spirit. He, he's, he knows he's, he's going to pass. And he says it. he falls to his knees, and I can only imagine that he probably took maybe a stone to the face from those people that were, were throwing it at him. And he got to his knees, and he didn't fight. He, he said something so profound. And he said, forgive them, for they know not. Forgive them. And it's, it's almost like it's a duplication of the heart of Jesus. That when he says, forgive them for they do not know what they do. It's a powerful message of how we as people with a new status, a new family, a new future are to love God's people and the people that even hate us. So I just want to challenge you in this. Would you love beyond what is expected of you? And would that look like caring? Would that look like forgiving? And would that look like serving? And can I be the first to tell you, I, th I thought as uh, a person growing up in Waianae, growing up in Nanakuli, that love was weakness. Love got pushed around. But then I looked at Jesus. And it was through his love that he changed the world. It wasn't through the rod, but it was through the cross. And because of that, we see 
billions of people transform, loving people. Over 2,000 years of a highway of saints who said yes to Jesus and now love people sacrificially. So yes, the, the bad news is bad, that we're lost without Christ, but the good news is good, that He has found us and that we can unify on the gospel. And that Proverbs 133, one says, and it's true, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. So I just want to close in saying this, that the, the thought process behind Romans is that it's God's redemptive plan to bring us a new status, a new family, a new future, and a new hope. Hey, we love you so much, Midweek New Hope family, and we'll see you next time.